because our homes are heating up the outside or cooling up the cooling down the outside when they shouldn't be? Or what about transportation? Putting major amounts of investment over the long term to build up transportation so seniors and young people can get around. And of course, like my like my friend, uh, like my colleague, Mr. Cash said, we have to invest. Uh, we have to make sure Canada Post is there for seniors. So I'd like you to really, hopefully, take a look at the Green Party this year and take a look at my candidacy. And uh, I want to thank again you for uh, tuning in. Open it up. Thank you. So now, Julie Zero Weeks, Weeks, Liberal Party. I'm sorry, Julie. Um, stay tuned. We'll be back soon after our commercials. session first I'm sorry yes oh, yeah. okay and we're back for the debate for Davenport we got to hear four candidates and they're ready to ask a few questions and the first question is about recession and the ballot we're going to pick a name and and do it the best you can because it's very important right now to answer that question Mr. Carlos Oliveira <laughs> Carlos Oliveira you have a two minutes to answer, answer that question. Okay, so a recession is defined as a two quarters with negative growth of the gross domestic product, the GDP. Uh, that's what happened in Canada the last two uh, quarters, but uh, 
First of all, I would like to say that the, the growth, the um, decrease in growth was minimal and that the last quarter, the growth, w the decrease was even less than what was projected. However, I wouldn't call it, other than for the technical definition, I wouldn't call it a, a true recession. There are other factors that have to be taken into consideration and uh, those, uh, if I can use my, my Help, memory helpers, I would like to, to refer to some numbers. These numbers were published by the uh, OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. These are numbers that are done by statistics. They collect, they promote, and all that, uh, and, and do it. So these are not numbers from Canada. And it shows that the last uh, from 2005 to 2014, Canada had uh, the biggest real GDP growth among the group of the G7 countries. Uh, actually, the growth was 1.9. I'm referring to 2005 to 2014. Why this is the, the biggest one of the, among the group of seven, which include also United States, Germany, uh, United Kingdom, France, uh, Japan, and Italy. There's also another aspect that I would like to call to, to draw to your attention, which is when we're talking about the recession, we don't see an employment growth like we had in Canada from 2005 to 2014 in the order of, I need my glasses, I'm sorry, 1.16. Again, it was the biggest growth in employment among the group of seven. Mr. Oliveira, your time is up. I'm Thank sorry. You. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, let's pick who's the next candidate who's going to answer this cash okay. question. So I'm gonna be here, right? Our second candidate is Dan Stain. Thanks, Juliana. You're welcome. You have a two minutes. in Ontario, we lost like 400,000 manufacturing jobs. And the reason why we're in a technical recession now is because the price of oil has plummeted. And our dollar was linked to the price of oil because of what the Conservatives did. But the real recession has been going on for a lot of people for around 8 to 10 years. The manufacturing depletion of jobs in Ontario has caused a massive kind of domino effect throughout the economy where people don't have enough money like they used to. You grew up in the 70s, just at the tail end, when government cared about people. You know, you could, you could make ends meet. And so what we have to do is not simply cite figures about GDP, which means nothing to the average person who has trouble making ends meet, paying for bills, paying for child care, uh, getting around in the city, getting a job. What we have to do is we have to bring ca uh, Canadian government, government in general, back into the economy. Don't leave it all to the market. And there was a time when governments did big things like build subways, uh, build a health care system. But we've got to get back into that. We've got tuition. Students are the future of our economy. And they're going into undergrad paying $8,000 a year and then professional or trade school paying equivalent or more. So what the Green Party says is it's time, you know, we've lost $40 billion in tax revenues since Cretin and Harper, uh, early Cretin, uh, late Cretin and, and Harper. So what we've got to do is start reinvesting in our economy, transit, uh, home retrofits, contracting, carpentry, electricity, electricians work, stuff like that. And, and that's why, again, I ask you, look at the Green Party, because the future is green, the choice is yours. Thank you, Mr. Dan. Our second candidate that's going to answer recession is... Julie Dezoro Ricks. <laughs> Julie, sorry. No, that's perfect. Do it's just better if I pronounce Zero it. It's exactly the name. Uh, and it's actually, it's perfect that I've actually uh, responded, just because I'm going to follow actually perfectly on, on to what Jan, Jan just mentioned. I'm actually very proud of the Liberal platform where uh, we have a huge proposal to uh, almost double the amount of infrastructure spending uh, over 10 years in Canada. 
And what we're trying to do is stimulate the economy. So whether or not you think we're in a technical recession or not, most people would agree that the economy in Canada is fairly flat. And if you look at what's actually happening around the world, the economy is flat in most countries around, around the world or in a recession, other than outliers like places like Germany. So for me, very proud of the infrastructure uh, investment uh, proposal that the Liberal uh, Party is proposing. So what we're trying to do is uh, we will du almost double the amount of infrastructure investment across Canada from 65 billion to 125 billion. This will allow our cities and municipalities to start planning for 10 years to say, yes, we can finally break our gridlock in a lot of our, our, our largest cities and towns. We can finally put in a 21st century transit system that is affordable and accessible to everyone. We can finally create more green spaces. We can finally create more daycare spaces that we desperately need. And we can provide more spaces for seniors uh, as we have an aging population and we don't have a lot of places that are affordable for them, as well as just affordable uh, uh, housing in general. So very, very proud. That we're the only party that's actually propo proposing such an ambitious plan. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm very proud of it. And, and I think that cities who've been asking, provinces have been asking, we are looking for multi-year funding. We haven't had a chance to actually plan out uh, our infrastructure growth. So not only is it, is, it, uh, is it that we're investing in new infrastructure, but we're actually creating jobs, uh, better paying jobs, and we're hoping that there's going to be a ripple effect um, as, as we help to stimulate the economy. Thank you, Julie. You're I appreciate. So, Mr. Andrew Quesh. Thank you, Julie. It's your turn. Thank you very much. You know, I've had, <clears throat> I've had so many conversations with people in the community, uh, particularly the parents of adult children and adults, young adults themselves, who are very frustrated and concerned about the fact that jobs that are available, if there are jobs available, are oftentimes short-term contract jobs, part-time jobs, temp jobs, uh, jobs that don't come with a pension or benefits or job security. And this is a very, very significant and real issue in our community and right across the country. And the NDP and myself as, the, as uh, the member of parliament here in Davenport have been the lead fighter in parliament and across the country to get us focused on the issue of precarious work. How do we build a society that's more caring, more stable, so that there is a stronger floor for all workers to stand on? Well, we do that with more affordable and available childcare spaces so that young people, when they're starting to think about having a family, they can imagine actually staying in our city. We need $15 a day childcare, and we're going to get it after this election with an NDP government. Also, universal pharmacare. This is within our reach in this election. Uh, we need to work on good jobs and paid internships. I have had enough of seeing young people work for free in our society. That is unacceptable. We need to move towards paid, paid work for people. Of course we do. We need to bring our country back to where we can be very, very proud of it. And I'm very proud of the NDP's offer. It's ambitious. It's multi-year funding, stable, predictable funding for public transit, finally, in our country. And I'm so proud to move forward with this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andrew. So now our second top is refugee system. Are you ready? Let's see who's going to be the first candidate to answer about refugee system. Mr. Andrew Cash. Thank you very much. <coughs> What's that? <laughs> I have to do this. Okay. Well, like so many Canadians, I, uh, I, I was just so incredibly, incredibly uh, upset and uh, uh, disturbed by the images that I keep seeing from Syria, and in particular the, the image that's flashed across the screens around the world of the young child on the, washed up on the beach. Uh, I have been fighting in the House of Commons for years now with the Minister of Immigration, Chris Alexander, to, in, to tell our government to do its part uh, to respond to this global crisis. The UN has called the Syrian refugee crisis, the worst humanitarian crisis 
since the Second World War. Uh, and the Conservative government has sat on the sidelines throughout the years of, of trying to get numbers from Chris Alexander, the minister, uh, to what's the government's response to this issue. We finally found out that the government's brought in 300 refugees. That is unacceptable. So what we need to do, we need to appoint a Syrian refugee point person within the bureaucracy. We need to pull resources from various departments of the government and actually do this. We can respond to the UN's demand from Canada to do its part. And what is our part? Our part is 10,000 Syrian refugees right away by the end of this year and a further 9,000 each year for the, for the subsequent four years. That's what the United Nations, that's what they're asking us. And Tom Mulcair and the NDP are committed to this. And why? Because this goes to the core of who we are as a country. This is about our values as a country. Are we an open-hearted, generous country that responds appropriately to the humanitarian crises which beset the globe? I say that's the kind of Canada I believe in. I know that's the kind of Canada uh, those who are watching. Your time is up, in. Mr. Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Our second candidate that's going to help is going to answer this question is. Carlos Oliveira. Thank you, Julian. First of all, I would like to correct something Mr. Andrew Cash just said. It's not 300 refugees. Actually, the numbers that the government published, it's 23,000 Iraqi refugees and 11,300 Syrian refugees. And the Prime Minister recently, recently announced 10,000 more. But this is not the problem. Of course, everything, something has to be done for those refugees that are knocking on the doors of uh, Europe and then they want to have a better life fleeing war, fleeing uh, uh, religious extremism and so on. And this is the root of the problem. The root of the problem is, that has, is the, the one that has to be dealt with. Because if we accept 50,000, 100,000 today, tomorrow there will be another 50,000, 100,000, if we don't correct the root of the problem. The root of the problem has to be, has to be uh, dealt with immediately. And that's what Canada is doing together with the coalition or part of which is uh, United States is a part of it, Germany, other countries, the, the Denmark and so, Nordic countries and so on, which is fighting the Islamic State. This is something that both the Liberal Party and the NDP says they won't do. So they, they won't attack the problem at the root of the problem. They just want to accept refugees, which we agree something has to be done. But one more word about accepting refugees. We cannot accept any person that says he's a refugee. There will have to be some screening to avoid that among those real refugees and that need help, serious help, don't come also some terrorists disfarced as, refu uh, as refugees. So this is, the pro this is the way the government is dealing with the problem. Attacking the root of the problem, yes, accepting refugees, but also screening them to maintain the security. Mr. Carlos, your time is up. Thank you, Thank you for explanation. Thank you. So our second candidate that's going to answer that question, which very interesting when it comes to refugee system. My personal opinion needs to be fixed. Not tomorrow, now. Julie Zerovix, <laughs> got it right. Great. Great Thank job. you. Great job. You know, Canada has always been a country that, we're, we're a country of immigrants. Every single person except for our First Nations, we're all a country of immigrants. And I think that through the years, we've done a really wonderful job of actually, of accepting refugees or migrants that are fleeing conflict or, or bad economies. In the, in the 50s, we did it for the Hungarians, sorry, in the 50s was Ukrainians, and the 60s was Hungarians, and the 70s was the Ugandans, and, and the Vietnamese. And I think that we can do a much better job than what we're doing right now. And so the Liberal Party has committed to, in addition to the 10,000 that are ready, the Conservatives have, have already committed to, we will, we will we've, we've committed to another 25,000 immediately in terms of Syrian refugees. We've also um, agreed, and I'll just sort of look at my notes, to invest an additional 100 million uh, for refugee processing just because to 
there is a process in terms of intaking and to provide another 100 million in terms of new contribution to the United uh, Nations High Commission for Refugees to support the relief activities because there's lots, there's lots of um, different camps that have been set up in, in the Middle East. Um, you know, my grandparents fled conflict after World War II. They were part of the new migrants that came to this country. They got settled and I, I truly want to go back I think it's to Andrew's point, I agree with it. We have to determine what kind of country we want to be. And I believe that we are a country of, of compassion, of opportunity, of progress, of fairness. And I too want to go back uh, to, to that type of a country. And I think that we need to be more open and more generous uh, to, to the refugee crisis that around the world. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. So now our third topic is I'm sorry. Maybe I'll I'm sorry, man. It's okay. I'm sorry because I thought it was going like this. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dan, it's your turn. Thanks, Julie. Yes. Um, you know, the refugee crisis in Syria is really interesting because a lot of people, like Mr. Oliveira, talk about the cause. Um, and it's important to remember, uh, just when we're talking about Syria, that uh, we've got hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees because of a Syrian war that lasted for, I'm not sure, five years or something. Mm -hmm. And that came after five years of incredible drought. We had an Iron Man ruled there, and then after five years of climate change uh, caused drought, we, we had war, and, and then now we have, we have, uh, we have more displacement. And, and the conservatives' uh, response is, let's change the subject. Let's talk about bombs, let's talk about jihad, because that's always their approach to anything. But you know anything international is. So let's drop a few bombs. Let's let's uh, exaggerate the threat of Islamic fundamentalism. Let's even suggest that people who are going overland, you know, thousands of kilometers. That's probably you know there's probably a few uh, terrorists in there. So we better as if we're not screening refugees to begin with. But you know anything to put up a smoke screen to help them get reelected uh, to hold on to power. It's disgusting because this is one of the biggest refugee crises of our time. And it brings back the times in Canadian history where we did not care, you know, as opposed to all the times where we did, where we built a caring society. So, you know, it, it's, it's a broader issue. We have to address our role in it in terms of spewing out carbon dioxide and changing the climate. We have to change our approach towards peacekeeping, disaster relief, helping uh, countries uh, grow their economies, international aid, we should commit to that, and we should start doing the humanitarian thing. I don't care if it's 10,000 or 5,000, bring in as many as we can handle, do it properly, resettle them, and show the world that we care, because so far we haven't, and that's, that's a real shame, a blot on our reputation. Thanks. Thank you. Our second topic, will be, third topic, will be C24. Let's see, which candidate we're gonna start it. Dan Stan, you're the first one. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> You're welcome. You know, C24 is a good segue for refugees because what C24 is, is an immigration uh, act, a bill, brought in by the conservatives which says that for those new Canadians who are committed or convicted of certain crimes, they're not going to be treated like uh, old stock Canadians, as Stephen Harper might call them, or people who were born here. Now what we can do is we can strip them of their citizenship. And it, it's, it, it's a direct attack on our charter rights and freedoms, which says we don't discriminate against people on the basis of, let's say, immigration, where they were born. So th th this, is, this is the old conservative playbook. Uh, they're, they're appealing to their base, whether it has to be with Bill C-51 and the anti-terror measures, or now in terms of you know, j uh, jingoistic politics and suggesting that uh, we have to be careful of the new immigrants. The old immigrants were fine. We went through wars and we went through conflict before, but we never suggested that it was legitimate to strip people of their citizenship the way we're doing now. Um, and, and, and so I, I think that all members of the Portuguese, Italian, and Spanish community, as, as anybody in that world, should be concerned. This is, this is a mixed and diverse riding where your neighbor comes from somewhere else, where we don't want to suggest, like, if you're, some, if you're from another country, you have less rights than, than other people. And you know that the proof of how terrible this act is, is it could immediately apply to Omar Khadr, who was basically taken as a child soldier and thrown into conflict. And under 
under the present law that the conservative passes, I understand, it would allow the government to strip him, not even with a judge, just an immigration officer. This is how low this act has, uh, has, has gotten our democracy. So I, I'm obviously against it, the Green Party's against it, and, and I think what we have to do is we have to do better by, by Canadians, and we have to reform our immigration system so we welcome in more Canadians, uh, more new Canadians, and we, we stop treading on this discriminatory. Thank you, Mr. Dent. And our second candidate that's going to answer this question is. Julie Zerowix. Thanks so much, Juliano. This immigration is probably one of the, the biggest issues in our writing. Uh, and I, I will be an absolute champion on this issue. I, I too agree that we absolutely have to change our, our immigration policy and our immigration uh, strategy today. It actually goes beyond uh, sort of this two-tier citizenship, uh, C24. It actually makes it more difficult uh, to become a Canadian citizen. Uh, it makes it more expensive to actually apply for citizenship. Uh, and it makes the, the residency requirements much longer. So there's a, there's a delay around it. In, um, Dan's mentioned this, but Davenport's probably one of the most diverse writings in this whole entire country. There are many uh, uh, people who come from other countries who've worked in this country, they're permanent residents, and they've waited for a while to become Canadian citizens. This actually will push them off uh, for many more years before they can actually apply for, for the Canadian citizenship uh, um, uh, under the new rules. Uh, and so I'm very angry at that, and I know that there's a lot of people in the writing that are very angry about that. You know, when my grandparents came in the 1950s, there was a very clear path to citizenship. That when they came, they, be, they were hosted, they became uh, permanent residents. They knew that within a certain period of time, it was a short period of time, they could actually take a test that didn't require them to actually speak perfect English or French, and it allowed them to become Canadian citizens. My mother's been in this country for 40 plus, 40, 40 plus years, I can tell you. Her, her English is, is quite, is not good. She would never pass the, the, uh, the citizenship uh, test of today, but I'll tell you, she's worked for over 30 years in this country, contributed to the Canadian economy, and, and considers herself Canadian be before any other culture. We have to change our immigration system, and uh, the Liberal Party would repeal C uh, C24 absolutely and wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carlos Oliveira. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. C24, it's a, a bill, like then said, uh, that will change the immigration and the citizenship act. Uh, I, feel, I feel there is a bit here, like happened the last elections, a, a fear campaign. The bill is not going to change much significantly the rights of the immigrants. Let's put it this way. When people say, oh, but now it's easier to get to, to strip people from citizenship, we're talking about serious matters, serious crimes that people commit, will have to commit to be stripped from their citizenship. And yes, it's done through the Minister of Immigration, but there is a due process. If you read the law, the, law will cl the bill will clearly indicate the steps. People are advised in advance that they will, uh, that are subject to a process for stripping their citizenship, and obviously they have all the rights, like any other person, there's a due process for all this. This is one aspect of it. Yes, it will delay slightly the acquiring of the citizen, Canadian citizenship. What, what I'm not hearing, it seems that when I hear it will delay. Are we talking about years? No, we're talking about one or two years. This is to make sure that people have a commitment to acquiring the Canadian citizenship and they have enough time because basically the rule change is one more year because before there were three years people needed to qualify a certain amount of residency time now it's four years uh, basically it's we're talking one year yes it's within the last six years which was not mentioned in the previous law if C24 is uh, it passes and this uh, gets into a, in in force. Um, this is, uh, like I said in the beginning, uh, let's put the facts clearly and uh, do not just uh, go into a tactic of fear campaign. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlos. So, 
Mr. Andrew Cash, it's your turn. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Giuliano. I want to just talk about a little bit about how Bill C-24 affects people in the community, in our community here in Davenport. I just remember a, a phone call I had from, uh, from a woman in the, in the community who immigrated here from Portugal. Uh, she has two children who are adults now. They were born here in Canada. And she called my office so angry at the Harper government because she believes, and I believe too, that her children who have dual citizenship, Canadian and Portuguese, uh, sh are, uh, should have the exact same status of citizenship as any other Canadian citizen. And I completely agree with that. Bill C-24 really tears at the fabric of who we are as a country. Bill C-24 changes the definition of who's a citizen and who isn't, or two classes of citizenship. I've fought this bill in the House of Commons as a multiculturalism spokesperson for the NDP. We have stood up countless times in the House of Commons to oppose this bill, and we will repeal this bill. Bill C-24, we will repeal it. This is the kind of bill that, that has no place in, in Canadian society. And, you know, I did a, um, a citizenship clinic uh, about a month and a half ago, and so many people called my office saying, Andrew, I want to, I'm, I'm, I've been here for a long time now, this is my home, I want to become a citizen. And then when we started to walk through all of the new obstacles that are being put in place to prevent people from becoming Canadian citizens, so many of my constituents left that clinic downhearted. That's not how we built this country. That's not how we did build this country in the past, and that's the way we need to build this country in the future with an NDP government. We're going to repeal Your time is over, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. So, now I'm going to open the opportunity for each candidate ask a question to, for example, Jolie, you can ask one question. You pick any candidate to ask one question, and the candidate has two minutes to answer a question. And then the same for Mr. Carlo, Mr. Um, Cash, and Mr. Dan. Okay, so um, let's start. Very interesting. Very interesting. I'm learning a lot. Mr. Dan Stan, who would you like to ask your question to? Well, um, Juliana, I'd like to ask my question to uh, Carlos, the uh, conservative. Carlos, go ahead. Okay. Um, Carlos, um, over the last uh, eight to ten years of conservative rule, Mr. Harper's run uh, six or seven deficits, depending on how you, you count them, and uh, added $150 billion to our debt. And now that we're in election year, they've decided to run on paper a surplus by raiding the EI fund and, and, and not spending money on fiscal commitments. My question to you is, when so many people are hurting, 600,000 seniors are in poverty, why isn't it instead time to raise corporate tax a little bit? We've lost like, you know, uh, it's gone from 22% down to 15, we've lost like $15 billion in corporate taxes. Why don't we raise corporate tax and invest in Canada, invest in a jobs program, or invest in poverty reduction? Why isn't the Conservative standing up for ordinary Canadians? Thank you for your question. Let's start from the beginning. The government is not running a, a, a surplus on paper. It's not on paper. It's a real surplus. And uh, it was not even projected to be this year. It was projected to be next year. By the end of the fiscal year, which was the end of uh, March, there was 1.6 billion surplus. That's true that the government ran um, deficits for some years, for a few years, but that was the external economy. A while ago, you mentioned that uh, the recession is made in Canada. I'm sorry, I differ. The, the recession is not made in Canada. It's not the government that sets the, the price of the oil. And the oil right now is the component, energy is the component that is really in the deficit in Canada. The Bank of Canada recently uh, declared that 80% of the economy is running well, is growing, and so on. The 20% is the energy that's not running well. Now, as to the seniors, you said that left some seniors uh, out of, um, 
I, I don't remember your exact words. Well, I remember that it was the government, this government, the conservative government, government that brought in the splitting of the income for tax purposes, for instance. That affected millions of seniors. It's the government, the conservative government, that created, it's, that announced, that uh, uh, created the tax-free savings accounts. Uh, it also helped a million point six, I believe, of uh, citizens, including many, many seniors. So, in fact, the uh, conservative government did not left anyone out of the growth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlos. So. The second candidate is going to be able to pick one candidate to ask a question will be Julie Zero Weeks. Thank you. Uh, my question, uh, uh, Juliano, is also going to be for uh, Mr. Oliveira. Um, Mr. Oliveira, I, I actually think that there honestly isn't uh, any sort of fear mongering. Uh, at least for me, uh, within the Davenport community around the immigration issues. Uh, I think you live among the community. I think that uh, it is very easy to come across stories where, and these, these are stories every day where you have a woman say, well, I've married a real, I'm a Canadian, I was born here, I married a, a wonderful man, uh, but it's been over five years and we've been waiting for him to become a Canadian citizen. You know, our, our marriage is now in jeopardy. Or you have families who will say, I've been trying to get my parents here, Daycare costs are so high, I desperately need some help. And plus they're alone in, in, in our home country, but we'd like to sort of uh, reunite our family. So uh, as, as someone who's, who's been an immigrant to this, uh, to this, uh, to this country, who, who lives among, uh, I think, one of the most blessedly diverse uh, writings in the country, what more do you think uh, you could be doing to be advocating to, to the Conservative Party uh, around immigration? There are a few things that have to be dealt with. I agree with you. Uh, I'm also an immigrant. I came to Canada when I was 34 years of age. I came by my own choice, not because someone asked me to come, or I came by my own choice and I chose Canada. I'm also an immigrant. Like I said in my introduction, my first job here in Canada was selling cars. It's not something that I ever did in Portugal. As to the immigration, yes, I know the community. I am Portuguese. I know the Portuguese community. It's not only that. There are a few other. There are a few issues in the immigration that have to be dealt with. Um, five, six years to become a, a Canadian citizen. Before it was three, four. So the difference is not that much before, if C24 is put into uh, in, in, in force. Uh, it's not a, a big difference. We're not talking a major big difference in time and so on. Um, I understand that the Portuguese community in Davenport has issues with immigration. Uh, Recently, the Prime Minister announced that something as that to review the immigration system to put immigration so that immigration responds to the needs of Canada. I don't know exactly what he say, what he means with that. It was recent that he announced this already during the campaign. I would like to know uh, what else can be done for the, the community. We changed, we created express entry. The express entry is a system that needs to be perfection. Of course it needs to be perfection. There was, for years and years, people came to this country under the contracts, work contracts and so on. There are sponsorships, can be, anyone can make a sponsor, can sponsor someone to Canada. To the parents, yes, it's a delayed process. But the applications, there are tons of applications and it, the process is delayed because of that. The time is Thank up, you. mister. Thank you very much. Everybody's okay? Great. Good. Thank you. The second candidate, I mean the third candidate is going to be able to ask in his question will be Andrew Cash. Okay, thank you. thank you. So Bill C-51 is an incredibly dangerous bill for our country. It compromises our ability to maintain privacy and it compromises our civil liberties. To who is going to be... Oh, I'm going to ask this. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm to gonna, who I'm is going to be? I'm going to ask this question to the Liberal candidate, Julie Zervich. Okay. 
it, it, Bill C-51 C allows law enforcement agencies unfettered access to, to our personal information. It, it's been opposed by former prime ministers, uh, Supreme Court judges, law professors, Amnesty International, and the NDP, and Tom Mulcair, our leader. You know, above and beyond all of the, uh, all of the opposition to this bill, this bill dramatically undermines Canadian values and weakens and tears apart the fabric of who we are as a country. Many people across the city were incredibly disappointed to see Liberal members of Parliament stand up in the House of Commons and vote with the Conservatives on this dangerous bill. So I want to ask the Liberal candidate, Julie Zarevich, why did the Liberal Party vote for this bill with the Harper government? What's happened to the Liberal Party? Mrs. Julie? Thank you, thank you Julie Angles. Thank you, Mr. Cash, for the question. Uh, I'm on record as, as saying that the bill as it currently stands is completely unacceptable. Uh, the Liberal Party uh, knows this and has proposed three very key changes. Uh, the first is that there would be a, uh, an oversight body that would be appointed. The second is uh, narrowing uh, down any definitions that might limit any of our freedoms. And the third is uh, to put in a sunset uh, clause, basically reviewing the whole bill in its entirety after three years. So for me, th those are three bills. And if I'm blessed enough to become the Member of Parliament in Davenport and, and the, the residents of Davenport ask me to do more, I would be advocating on their behalf. Uh, I, I, would, I would also like to mention, and, and I think we have to remind ourselves, in October of 2014, there, there were a couple of incidences uh, that sort of brought to light um, uh, some, uh, that there might be a need for some additional tools for our enforcement officers uh, to be able to better protect Canadians. And so the whole reason uh, why C-51 came about was because there we had some security officers who said, we desperately need some more tools. The world has changed. Security has changed. Risks have changed around the world. And so we have to uh, be considerate of that. And so for me, uh, irrespective of what ends up happening with C-51, there's a very real need uh, uh, to uh, for us to, to be aware that there are some additional protections that Canadians need to, to, to look into. But on C-51, I'm very clear, the bill as it currently stands is not acceptable. There's three very clear changes that the Liberal government has said that they will change as soon as, uh, if we're blessed enough to, be, to, to become a majority government. And again, if I am the Member of Parliament for Davenport, uh, I, would, uh, Time is up. I would listen to the residents of Davenport. Thanks so much. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. So. Mr. Carlo, now it's your turn. turn. It's my turn. It's your and turn. I'm going to put my question to the Liberal candidate. Um, your, the leader of your party, Mr. Trudeau, has been announcing that he's going to run for three consecutive years deficits. Yes. Okay. Is it two or three? Three. Okay. Three consecutive okay. years. Um, Canada has a, a debt of around $612 billion, and it's federal government. If we put together with the provinces, it will reach $1.1 trillion. This in an economy that is $1.9 trillion a year. Last, uh, last year, there has been, the conservative government has been uh, working in order to reduce, to, to reduce the debt instead of growing it. Also, the, liberal, the leader of your party announced that he's going to increase the taxes on those who can pay more, that's his words, more or less, and, uh, and give them to those who need more, uh, who need financial help. Uh, this is kind of a Robin Hood tactic uh, that I really don't understand. Uh, even so, with the deficit, because the deficit is supposed to be to invest in infrastructure, all the promises that uh, the, all the, the costs don't add up. Mr. Trudeau has been announcing investments, he has been announcing programs and so on, that will go way far from the revenue that Canada receives. 
in, namely increasing taxes on workers. For instance, the employment insurance tax would be increased. A, a, reg, a, a worker that makes about $60,000 a year will pay $1,000 more in EI taxes. And the employers, an employer, a company that has 10 employees, will pay about $6,000 more per year. Are you asking a question? Uh, so I'm going to ask a question. My question is who pays for all this? It's, is it raising taxes the only solution? So thank you very much, Mr. Oliveira. Um, uh, I'm very pleased to respond to this. Uh, first, I think that Mr. Oliveira actually brings up a wonderful point. The Liberal government does have to present how we're going to actually pay for a lot of the big announcements that we've actually been announcing for the last little while. We've not put out that budget. It's, it's pending, so it's about to be announced. We have a few other big announcements to make before we actually put the whole thing together, okay? So that is coming and I want the public to know that we will be showing you exactly how we're going to be paying for everything. Mr. Oliveira very rightly has indicated, uh, my notes sort of indicate it's, uh, that we're gonna be running, you're right, it's, it's, uh, it's deficits of about $10 billion uh, for three years and we, we are promising to, to go back uh, to uh, a balanced budget in 2019. Um, and just so people can put things into context, the, the Canadian government, uh, our, our economy is a two trillion dollar economy, and we're talking about a $10 billion deficit uh, for three years. In order to invest in the infrastructure we desperately need for the 21st century in Canada to stimulate the economy and to create more jobs. Uh, so we're doing that very deliberately. I, I will mention uh, also, and this is not easy for me to explain at the doors, but I do do it. We have one of the lowest debt uh, to GDP ratio in the world. So that means, say you have a house that's worth a million dollars. It's like owning, owing about $200,000. Uh, so you're thinking, okay, well, we could sort of manage that and still maybe put in a new kitchen and a washroom and add value uh, to, to the house. Um, so I, I just want people to know that we're not jeopardizing our overall economy at all by, by doing this temporary deficit in order to uh, invest in growth, in jobs, and in the inf infrastructure that we desperately need. Lastly, in terms of just um, uh, sort of uh, taking money from sort of uh, the wealthier to, to redistribute the income, it is no secret that we have um, a, an increasing inequality between the rich and the poor. We're doing everything we can to try to strengthen the middle class. So Julie? I've run out of time, but I'll respond maybe at the very end. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to ask if anybody has a question about anything. If anybody's being um, treated differently mm -hmm. or with any favor, I'd like to know. If it's not, I'd like to thank you for coming over. And then um, I wish a good luck to everyone. And the one thing I want to make sure is NOSA TV Canada and Kamoy's Radio, it's. Um, it's a TV that cares about our community, mm -hmm. especially the people that came to Canada with a dream and want to make things happen, think about their family back home. And then um, we're going to follow this campaign. And whatever it wins, we're going to follow that too. So if any one of those words that's being brought up to win an election fell down, we're going to make sure that wasn't right. Because I think the real media is the media that cares about the people and not only about the candidates. The candidates are very important to our country. That's why we need to elect it. Truthfully and honest people to look after us. As an immigrant, I'm giving them my personal opinion. We've been suffering a lot back home already. Canada, I call home. This is where I want to grow my kids, raise my family, raise my grandkids, and carry on my name. And we need a good candidates. We need a good politicians. And I, I really, bottom of my heart, wanted to thank you to come over, to put your face out there, and showing the courage, the honesty, and dignity to run a campaign with the truth. So. MTVC and Kamoy's Radio, always going to be here to listen to your voice and to transmit what you have to say. But let's do this together as one. Because Canada doesn't need one or two or three. Canada needs one. Mm -hmm. All together, we can be one. 
and let's not let fell, you know, down the whole system. Immigration, um, refugee, let's say uh, um, recession, and other things. It's all important for us to look after. And after you being elected, keep us posted. Keep us knowing. Don't disappear. Let's be reasonable to, to the population to be able to reach you anytime, anywhere, because it is important the candidates, I mean, it is important to the people to know where they can find the candidate that he's at uh, this vo vote for. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, okay. Thank Appreciate you very much. Okay. Yes, it is a close of remarks. So, Julie, do you like to say anything that watching us right now, any message, why they should vote for you? Uh, thanks very much, Julie. I, I, I do have, I, I do have uh, closing remarks. To me, this, ele is, this election is, is about a couple of things. It's about the kind of Canada we want to live in. My, my grandparents came to this country. Uh, they, they see this country and they saw this country as a land of opportunity, of, of freedom, of progress, of fairness, of compassion. And that's the kind of country that I will continue to work for and I will fight for. Uh, whether it's immigration policy, whether it's economic policy, uh, any of that. The second reason is this, this um, election is also about our future. And so for me, looking after our economy, uh, looking after our infrastructure needs, uh, creating a plan for growth, for jobs, uh, is very important. And I'm very proud of the Liberal platform. And so I, I thank you very much, Juliano. Thank I you, thank Julia. very much our, our candidates uh, for today for allowing me to speak and look forward to, uh, for the, to the next month. Thanks. So thank much. you. Mr. Dan, please, to this camera. Thank, thanks, Juliano. Th you're you're welcome. thank my fellow candidates uh, for coming by on a, on a beautiful day. And, uh, and I want to thank you for tuning in and watching us on the internet. Um, this is, you know, as they say, every election is important. This is a very important one. And uh, what Canada needs now is real change. And what we've seen over the past decade or more is a government that has been starved of resources. And, and the reaction from the other parties has been on the one hand, the Liberals are promising to keep taxes relatively low, maybe a little bit on the edges, but they're gonna spend tens of billions of dollars of more debt to fund an infrastructure program, which we badly need. And then we have uh, the, the NDP, which is promising a little bit of change. Uh, in eight years, you'll get $15 a day daycare, but next year, it might be $150 a day, and then the year after that, it might be 60 and, and so on. A little bit here and there. But it's, it's not yesterday's, it's not Tommy Douglas's NDP or CCF. It's a different NDP. What we're saying is, let's go back to the Canada 10 years ago, even, where we had a robust, strong government that was able to do big things. Unlike what Ms. Zerowitz said, the Green Party actually has a plan for huge infrastructure investment in our, uh, in our uh, transit, in our community uh, recreation and sports, and we want to retrofit buildings and provide a job stimulus program. They're not the only ones with uh, I big ideas. I, I commend them on the ideas they have. It's, we don't need to go into debt for it, though. And, uh, and, and so, and, and we are also, we haven't let Stephen Harper's government scare us away from real environmental action. One of the downsides of Bill C-51 is really it villainizes environmental activists and it potentially targets them with these crazy powers. And unlike what Mr. Cash said, the NDP wasn't the only party to oppose it. Ms. Elizabeth May, our leader in Parliament, was the first party leader to oppose it. Then Monday after the Friday was released because you could see in black and white what a terrible bill this was. She, she knew that when you're talking about waiving charter rights, and expanding the definition of terrorist activity to include things like environmental activism or municipal bylaw infraction, that this is a bill that has to go. So what I ask you to do is, when you're looking for real change and you say, you know what, we need government to be in there creating jobs, lifting the 600,000 seniors out of poverty, and, 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 and getting us uh, where the we time is up, Mister. Uh, look at the Green Party. Thanks very much. Thank you. Mr. Carlos Oliveira. First of all, I would like to thank Radio Camões and uh, Julian, thank you. yourself, and to all the fellow candidates that are here with me. I think this election um, is uh, about uh, 
keeping the, um, the stability of the Canadian economy. We have an economy that grew the last years, it's proved by the numbers of the, like I mentioned before, of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. We have had a country that um, had created uh, jobs uh, and uh, the growth in jobs is one, is top among the group of the G7. So I think that the, what has been done to look after the economy should continue. Now it's not the time to change course because the international economy is not stable. So if we're going to experiment, if we're going to change course right now, we might get in trouble later on in the future. Uh, the investments, uh, there are some investments that I need, but the Canadian government, the Conservative government, also has a plan for infrastructure, and it's already being used by the provinces and municipalities. I also, all this is a result of some, the leadership we have in the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister is a person that is recognizing internationally, and we see that when the, he goes to the <coughs> forums of G27 or G20. The other aspect I would like to, to, to bring here is security, security of the country. This has been done through the leadership of the, of the government, but also through the changes that have been implemented, like Bill 51, like for Bill, sorry, Bill C-51, I'm sorry, and uh, uh, a few other changes that have been made in the, um, in the, in the, the acts that pertain to, the, to security, to police and policing and so on. Uh, I think that this is the course that we should keep and that's what I'm asking. Thank you, Mr. Carlos, Mr. Androkesh. Thank you, Giuliano, and I, you. I would like to thank uh, Nosa TV and uh, Camoish Radio for, for this. And to all, the, all those that are watching this this afternoon, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to listen to uh, your candidates. And I have to tell you, I am so excited about our platform and so proud of, of our leader, Thomas Mulcair. We can make such a change in our country in this election. Affordable $15 a day child care a federal minimum wage in this country of $15 an hour that is going to set a standard for all the provinces to reach that. Better pensions for our seniors, a national pharmacare program for those that don't have an extended, extended health benefits at their place of employment, and my goodness, we know so many that don't have any coverage at their job. These are transformative things. It's going to change our city it's going to be transformative for our families and it's going to make our country a fairer more prosperous country we need to repair the damage that stephen harper has done to this country and i invite you all to come and work with us so that on october 20th we can stand with prime minister tom Mulcair and build the canada of our dreams thank you very much thank you very much I do really appreciate this is a live debate and uh, be ready, be smart and vote right. I'm a Giuliano De Luca for MTVC Camoys Radio. Thank you.